confess our sins to God who forgives and saves. Let's confess together. Yep. Well, uh, Joni watched some of the worship service last Sunday. She's, she noted uh, at Fairmont, as soon as Labor Day was over, they went back to their robes. They wear, they wear albs in the summer. She said, why didn't you go back to your robe? robe? I said, well, you weren't there to remind me. So I said, now I will. Yeah, I just didn't think of it. Yep. Well... All right. Uh, I got to go print this off the because last I cannot she, read it. She noted uh, at Fairmont. So I will be back. Labor Day was over. They went back to their robes. Oh, they, they wear they wear You'll, all you'll keep a seat Why warm. Uh, is the temperature okay in here? I mean, I've got layers on now. But I don't think anybody turned on the heat. Now, I didn't turn it on when I got here. I didn't look to yeah, see, see what it says. It. You're not cold?
Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Carol. Good morning, and uh, welcome to worship this morning. Uh, welcome to those of you who are here with us. It's good to have you here with us. Uh, welcome to everyone at home as well, watching this either uh, live as we do this or watching it later. Welcome to you. We're glad to have you join us for worship uh, as well. Uh, welcome in the name of Jesus Christ who gathers us in whatever form uh, for worship this morning. As we come for worship, I'm going to start with the announcements. Uh, and I'm just going to run through the ones that are on the, uh, the screen as a reminder to me of what I need to say. So our, our Bible study will happen again, our virtual Bible study at 6.30 uh, on Thursday as we continue to go through the book of Acts. Uh, I am thoroughly enjoying going through Acts. And this week, we start to get into the narrative and some of the uh, uh, miracle stories and the dramatic way that the early church uh, grows. Uh, this morning, uh, this week, uh, the crop walk will occur, uh, the New Carlisle crop walk, and uh, it's going to be done in a socially distanced manner. Uh, but we're going to take an offering this morning to support our uh, our walkers this year. We've got Cindy and Linda and uh, Taylor and Lindsay, I believe, are going to be our four walkers. So if you want to support them, uh, maybe designate a little bit of your giving this morning for the crop walk. Uh, we've put our, our box to collect non-perishable food items uh, for the Bethel Church's United Food Pantry in the back entryway. Uh, that'll be there through September and October. So Feel free to either bring something and drop it off on a Sunday or sometime during the week as well. Uh, there is the book club that we've been invited to uh, take part in, along with Faith Presbyterian Church in Huber Heights. That'll start tomorrow night. Uh, that'll run three Mondays. If you need the link, let me know, and I'll send that to you. Uh, the farmer's market, of course, is still going on. Oh, and this is the one uh, October 4th, so not next Sunday, but the Sunday after. It will be World Communion Sunday. And we'll be sharing a communion here. It's been a while since we've been able to share communion because back in, in March and April and May when we ought to have had it, we were still kind of reorienting because of the pandemic. We finally, I think, have our feet under us and so have figured out a way to serve world, uh, communion um, on October the 4th. Uh, for those watching at home uh, or if you're here and think you'll be at home uh, on October 4th, uh, please have some bread and juice ready that morning so you can also participate in that. It doesn't matter what kind of bread, doesn't matter what kind of juice, uh, as long as you have something. And then in the, the liturgy for communion, uh, when we bless the bread here, uh, when we consecrate it, we will also do so with the bread that uh, is at home prepared there uh, for the meal that we will share together as a congregation and together with all the churches. Uh, around the world that will be observing World Communion Sunday. Uh, those are the announcements for this morning. Uh, for sharing, uh, I want to ask you to be in prayer this week for Ron and Jane's little granddaughter, Bexley. Uh, Bexley will have surgery on Thursday, uh, early Thursday morning, as, uh, for, as long as everything goes according to schedule, uh, to correct her, her tethered spinal cord. So, Pray that everything goes well, uh, that it goes uh, according to schedule. Uh, pray for the best outcome uh, and for peace of mind for everyone. Uh, Bexley will be in hospital for a number of days afterwards. Um, let's surround her and Sean and Christy with prayer this week uh, that there may be a, a, a positive outcome to the surgery and peace of mind through it all. Uh, for mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and everyone. Um, let's just remember uh, to support them in prayer. Uh, I also want to share with you, we heard this week that Jerry Irwin was in hospital uh, with kidney stones and then with complications from those uh, kidney stones. Please uh, uh, keep Jerry in your prayers, prayers for recovery uh, for her. I think that's all of our announcements and uh, sharing, so I will invite you to prepare your hearts and minds as we turn now uh, to worship.
How are we all doing? Are we ready? Let's call one another to worship. Uh, would you join me in the call to worship here on the screen? Shout for joy all to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is good. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pastors. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Come, let us worship the Lord. And we're going to do so with Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Let us confess our sins to God, to God who forgives and saves. Let us confess together uh, this prayer. Gracious God, we have sought after things, but we have not sought after you. We have expected generosity, but we have not shown generosity. We have not been gracious or grateful. We have failed to remember all that you have done. Forgive us and fill our hearts with gratitude. Help us to share our gifts and strengthen our legs so that we can run after you, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. People of God, our sins are forgiven. God is merciful and gracious and is Lord of us all. Reconciled to the God who loves us, let us live and love through Christ our Lord. Glory be to our Creator, praise to our Redeemer, Lord. Glory be to our Sustainer, ever free and ever one, one in might and one in glory, while And knowing the peace of Christ, we share the peace of Christ with one another and continue to do so in a distanced fashion. So the peace of Christ be with you and also, also with you. Um, there are all kinds of signs of fall around us. I'm aware, well, I've got my robe on, so we must be back to fall. And it's a little cooler 
which means that my hot air is fogging up my glasses a whole lot. So forgive me this morning if I fidget with my glasses and my mask. Um, another thing to get used to. All right, uh, as we turn to scripture, uh, will you bow with me uh, for a prayer for illumination? Holy God, your word is strong and leads our feet to your holy dwelling place. Strengthen and guide us with your word through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, uh, our scripture texts both come from the Old Testament. Uh, we have a psalm and then a passage from Exodus. Uh, so listen for the word of the Lord. Uh, first here from Psalm 103 verses 7 to 13. The psalmist writes, The Lord made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. And then from Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 to 25, listen uh, for the word God has for God's church today. Exodus 14, 19 to 25. The angel of God who was going before the Israelite army moved uh, and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched his hand uh, out over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land. And the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar uh, of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right. I'm going to begin today uh, with a story that comes to us from a Hebrew Midrash, from the oral tradition that accompanied the Hebrew scripture, sometimes adding uh, these delightful stories like this one about uh, Nachshon. And I'm going to come down. I'll have the pictures up here and you can see the pictures somewhat but you can't read it up there and I can't read it up there, so I'm gonna sit down here so I can read it off the computer screen. Uh, so the story of Nachshon, Nachshon is this character that uh, 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 Hebrew legend has it. Uh, was Tradition has it that Nashon, when Israel came to 
crossed the Red Sea, Nashon was the first one to step into the sea. Uh, and I like this delightful telling of the story of Nashon. In the days when Pharaoh ruled and the pyramids cast their shadows over Egypt, there lived an Israelite slave named Nashon. Nashon's parents, grandparents, and even his great-great-grandparents had lived as slaves, but Nashon knew that long ago his family had been free, and he dreamed of freedom every night. From dawn to dusk, under the midday rays of the desert sun, Nashon's father and brothers labored in the quarries, mixing straw and mud into bricks. Nashon slipped past the taskmasters and smuggled in cool drinking water for them. Uh, neither the Egyptian taskmasters nor Pharaoh himself scared the young boy. His family began calling him Brave Nashon. When Pharaoh and his royal courtiers arrived in the city market, most slaves fled in fear. Not Nashon. He trailed behind and spied on them. Whatever Nashon learned, he reported to the Israelite elders. Soon, everyone began calling him Brave Nashon. <coughs> Nashon, though, had one fear. In the evening, when most slaves took a cool swim in the river Nile, Nashon stood anxiously on the river's edge. He put his toes in the water and trembled. Some days, he imagined a giant crocodile grabbing his legs. Other days, he pictured himself sinking slowly to the river's bottom, as though bricks were tied to his ankles. The other slaves began calling him brave Nachshan, who is afraid to swim. When Nachshan grew old enough, the taskmasters demanded that he join his father and brothers in the quarries. Each day was long, dull, and dusty. The years passed slowly. As much as he dreamed of freedom, Nachshan feared he would always be a slave. Just when Nachshan began to give up hope, a stranger arrived, promising freedom for the Israelites. News of the visitors spread like uh, a sandstorm. Nachshan ran to the riverbank to join the crowd, waiting to hear him speak. His name is Moses, whispered a fellow slave. He says he is an Israelite, but he was raised in the royal palace until Pharaoh learned his true identity. Then he ran away. He says that God has sent him back to Egypt to demand our freedom. Nachshan's heart leapt at the sight Moses' face glowed like the sun, and his eyes glistened like stars. He had a sapphire blue shepherd's staff, carved in the shape of a serpent. Though he spoke haltingly, his message was clear. You must have faith that freedom is possible, Moses proclaimed, holding his staff toward the heavens. Real freedom means trusting God. Real freedom means believing in yourself. That evening, their hope renewed, the Israelites, uh, Israelite slaves played in the cool waters of the Nile. Brave Nashon, come celebrate with us, called his friends. Even today, with the possibility of freedom, are you still afraid to swim? Moses saw Nashon hesitate. He walked over, bent down, and whispered into the boy's ear. Real freedom means facing your fears and overcoming them. Nashan looked at the, the river and repeated Moses' words to himself. It took all his courage just to dangle his legs into the current and splash some water on his body. The next morning, Moses approached Pharaoh and demanded freedom for the Israelites. Pharaoh's heart was hard. He not only rejected uh, the plea, he made the Israelites work harder. But Moses told the people not to give up hope. God will send plagues over Egypt to soften Pharaoh's heart, he predicted. The plagues did not frighten Nachshon. When God sent frogs, Nachshon caught a pear in a basket and let his nephews and nieces play with them. When God sent locusts, 
Nakshan picked each and every insect off the few uh, vegetables in his family's small garden. When God made the land pitch black with light only in Israelite homes, Nakshan ventured outside to check on his neighbors. Finally, Pharaoh gave in. He told Moses to take the Israelites and leave. Nakshan and his family packed quickly, without time even to let their bread rise. The Israelites headed to the Sea of Reeds and camped on its shores. Suddenly, in the distance, the Israelites heard a strange noise. First, it sounded like rain, then like a, a large swarm of hornets, then like a herd of gazelles. Nachshon ran to the top of a small cliff and looked in the direction of the noise. It was the sound of chariots. The Egyptians are coming, he cried. The Israelites wept with fear. They were trapped between the advancing uh, Egyptians and the Sea of Reeds. Nachshon knew what he must do. Moses' words echoed in his mind. Real freedom means trusting in God. Real freedom means believing in yourself. Real freedom means facing your fears and overcoming them. Nachshon stepped slowly into the sea. The water rose from his toes to his ankles to his knees to his waist to his chin to his lips. Nachshon repeated silently, face your fears, have faith. Just as the water was about to cover his head, a miracle occurred. Moses lifted his staff to the heavens, and a strong east wind pushed back the water, creating a dry path through the sea. All the Israelites joined Nachshon and walked with him to freedom. When they each reached the opposite shore, the Israelites broke into song. But Nachshon simply waded in the sea and let the cool waters remind him that he was free. Free from slavery and free from his fears. All right. I like that. You never think about who was the first one to step out into the water. I like that little detail that uh, uh, Hebrew tradition adds. All right, I can turn this one off. Before and behind. So, I sympathize with Israel in this moment uh, when it looks like there is no way to freedom, no future worth grasping. Here they are. They have challenged the powers that be they, and upended the status quo. They made a decisive move to change their lives by leaving everything behind, stepping out in faith, and here they are, stuck. Stuck between a past not worth returning to and a future blocked by a, a muddy, marshy sea. I sympathize with them because I've been there. I've been stuck in, in the neutral zone. I've been there in the space between uh, what was where what was is past, but what will be has not yet been revealed. And I, for one, know from experience that I would rather that God stayed clearly out in front. I want God to let me know what the next move is. Where are we going? I want God to show me the way into the future, into the promised land. All right, Lord, we know you have a new reality for us out there on the other side of this pandemic. You are calling us all to something new. You hold all things in your hands, our future and our past. God has a plan for you and for me. God has a plan for Honey Creek and for New Carlisle. It would be great if God would let us know what that plan is. It would be great if God would let us know sooner rather than later. It would be our preference, my preference anyway. It would be great if God would let us know what is waiting on the other side of this, uh, this impasse, this time that challenges and changes so much of what ordered our lives. I get it. God's presence moves behind Israel to protect them, uh, to serve as a rear guard, to buy them time. I get it. I'm just saying, for my own peace of mind, 
It'd be nice to see a pillar of fire or cloud clearly marking the way ahead, clearly marking the right way to go, clearly marking the road to God's future. Instead, Israel stands there staring at a monumental obstacle. And God's visible presence picks up from before them where it had been leading and moves behind them. I guess this is one of those times that we live by faith and not by sight. It's helpful to know God is behind us. It's helpful to look back and see where God has acted in our lives, in our our history, in our past. To know that God was there then emboldens us to face uh, an unknown future. Life is uh, full of obstacles, but it's encouraging to look behind, to look uh, to our past and see the ways that God has provided for us, to see the ways that God has delivered us and helped us overcome challenges and obstacles before. Uh, That memory of the past, that glance back can give us the courage, uh, the energy, uh, the the chutzpah even. That's going to be a problem when I want to advance my slide. That glance back to see what God has done in our past um, gives us the, the... wherewithal, to take on obstacles staring us in the face, to climb or tunnel or move the mountain, to step out into the water and know that we will not be lost in the sea. Taking a look back, we can find the courage and strength to step out in faith. And when we step out, we often 